So first thing I want to do is I want to share my screen and I want, want to take you to Cengage. All right, so this is a picture that comes from uh, Unit 9 and it's a bonding molecular orbital. And basically it is showing two 1s orbitals that come together and they overlap forming a sigma bond. And we're expected to believe that when those two orbitals overlap, in this region, in between the two orbitals, there is good possibilities and good sharing of electrons and good bonding that's formed as a result of that. Um, I don't really have any problem with understanding or accepting or believing that. Um, I think maybe it's because I've just all, ever since I was 17 or 18 and I first started studying chemistry, um, we did sharing of electrons, right? And so it's easy for me to think of electrons being shared and I think about atoms coming together and, and these, the way these orbitals overlap, there's a good chance for electrons to be shared. The problem comes, in my opinion, is when we look at an antibonding orbital, which starts off looking exactly the same. So let me bring up one of those. So here's an antibonding orbital. Here is an s orbital and a minus one s orbital, whatever the H-E double hockey stick that is, right? But they come together, and for some reason, as they come together, there's this nodal plane. There's this part in between where they do not overlap. And I don't really get that. It just seems like here I've got this blue thing and I've got this turquoise thing and they come together and for some reason they don't overlap. And this is what's meant by an antibonding orbital. But I don't really have a mechanism for understanding why this blue balloon and this turquoise balloon <laughs> come together and don't overlap at all. And so that's what I think is that one, one part of at the heart of, not, of students not being able to get to uh, bonding and antibonding orbits. And so I wanna show you a couple of things that um, might, make, might help make sense to it, might help make sense of it. So let me stop that share for a second. Let me come back here and pin a video. Okay, all right. So um, in physics, in physical science, uh, one of the things that I learned about was destructive and constructive interference. Constructive. and destructive. Do you have any memories of learning about those things, Kevin? Um, I think I vaguely remember it, yeah. Yeah, so you probably fit exactly into the same category as almost every Chem 140 student. You might have seen it, and you, but you vaguely remember it. And so, um, I'm going to share the screen and I'm going to show you a couple of pieces of uh, video clips, which maybe you'll take the, uh, the clips and add them into the, the comments or into a way the student can uh, link to these. But I'm just going to bring them up here in a second. I'm not going to play the video for you, but if, if somebody wants to uh, uh, click on the link and watch the whole video, they can. But if I back up here a little bit in this video, it shows two waves on top of each other. There's a blue one and a, and a purple one. And they show how those waves can be superimposed upon each other. And so the, the, these two waves, they're identical, they're superimposed on each other. And if we start adding those two waves together, we get this green line, a super big positive wave of the same frequency but of twice the amplitude, okay? I'm okay. gonna, as they, as they keep on going through this video, they bring up, let's see if I can find it easily. That's the same one. 
Now they brought up this second wave and you'll see that where it has a peak, the blue wave has a trough. And where it, where the purple wave has a trough, the blue wave has a peak. It's the exact same frequency, it's just off by a little bit, off by exactly half a wave, I guess, half a wavelength. And as they bring them together, you can see that they're superimposed. And when they put, when they add these two waves together, they're going to cancel each out, other out along this green line. And so by taking a, one wave and its exact opposite and adding them together, you, you end up with no sound, no wave. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so that's destructive interference. The first case where they were added together is constructive interference. And the second case is destructive interference. And maybe it'll show us here a little bit longer. Okay, so one of the things that is easy to forget when we look at these pictures of atoms is that they look like balloons. They look like solid objects. And so it's very easy for us to fall into the trap of saying oh, electrons, waves, orbitals, they're like particles, they're things. But one of the things that we know about ele electrons is that they're actually waves or they, ha or they have wave-like pro uh, properties. And so thinking about the constructive and the destructive interference of waves, it begins, at least for me, I get a hint of understanding that says, hey, in some cases, you can have a 1s orbital and a 1s orbital, and they can constructively interfere to form this particular, in this case, bonding orbital. But I can also have a wave and its exact opposite wave, and when I add those together, I end up with this part of the orbital that there is no overlap. There is no bonding that takes place. This wave doesn't add, it actually cancels each other. They cancel each other out in exactly this place across this nodal plane. And so for me, when I look at bonding orbitals and anti-bonding orbitals, when I look at bonding orbitals, I always think of constructive interference of waves. And when I look at anti-bonding orbitals, I'm thinking about them as being this destructive interference of waves. And so if I have an atom come together with another atom and the orbitals overlap, Sometimes those orbitals will overlap in ways that create really good bonding. And typically, good bonding means, now I'm going to put on this axis, energy. And so I have these two uh, atoms come together. When, they when, they can, when the orbitals can interact well and positively, constructively, we end up with a good bonding orbital that is of lower energy and they can interact destructively in this way and i'm going to draw it with a dotted line this time an anti-bonding orbital that is of less le that's not as stable that is of higher energy and doesn't help to bring the atom together and so we you will see in this course in the text in ways of thinking about how atoms with their electrons that are made up of waves come together, that as at this atom and this atom come together, they, the orbitals can overlap to form this nice bonding orbital down here, in my mind, by, this, by something equivalent to constructive interference. And they can combine destructively to form this anti-bonding orbital. How does that sound so far, Kevin?
Okay, so sometimes they work well to bond and be more stable. And so that's why they're lower in energy. But then other times they kind of don't bond in a bad way. And it's, sure. and it's less stable. It's, it's more energetic. Yes, yes. And it's, um, all of those things are true. So let's pretend that I have something with one, elect one electron in it, OK? And something else with one electron in it. What are, we, what's, what are those things? Well, we know they're hydrogens, right? So one of the things that I know, and you know, and probably every student in our course knows, that hydrogen forms a very nice H2 molecule. And according to this uh, molecular orbital theory of bonding, these two hydrogens come together and they can overlap such that they form this nice bonding orbital. Oh, this bonding orbital can hold one, two electrons. And so hydrogen will bond with another hydrogen because we put two electrons in this bonding orbital. And as a result, H2 forms really nicely because overall, if I look at all of the bonding in the anti-bonding orbitals, I've got a preponderance of electrons in my bonding orbital. So far, so good? Okay. Yeah. Let's, do, let's do the next element over, helium. my piece of paper. My next element over, I've got a helium. And as we know, helium has two electrons. It comes together with another helium that has two electrons. We know, apparently we know, that sometimes the waves of those electrons interact in such a way that we get constructive interference, and so we end up with a bonding orbital. Um, but sometimes those orbitals will interact in such a way that we end up with an anti-bonding orbital. Okay? So as I bring those two heliums together, I've got, they, we can have overlap and we can form these uh, uh, two, two orbitals, two bonding, two, two combined orbitals. <laughs> and look, I've got four electrons to put in here. So I'm gonna put in one, two down here. Oh, that looks really, really promising. <laughs> I've got my two heliums can put two electrons in here into the bonding orbital. That should help hold them together but I haven't used up all the electrons that I have available. I have to put up two in here as well. And so if I look at this molecular orbital diagram for combining two heliums together, I have two electrons in my bonding orbitals. I've got two electrons in my anti-bonding orbitals. So I have no net bond that forms between these two. And so as a result, we don't observe HE2 because they trying to distribute the electrons between the bonding and the anti-bonding orbitals. There is no net strength or energetic advantage of those two being joined to each other. And so we don't observe HE2, no bond. That's my way of understanding um, bonding and anti-bonding orbitals. Yeah, I, I think that definitely helps with the examples. I, I was kind of confused at first why sometimes we have good bonds and sometimes we have bad bonds, but it looks like we, we use the electrons and we kind of fill, fill it out like an energy level diagram sort of. To, to see if we have that constructive work with the electrons and bonding, or if it's the destructive anti-bonding. Right, right. And in this case, we've worked, we've looked at 
orbitals that clearly have good symmetry, good overlap, right? Uh, a 1s orbital for a helium and a 1s orbital for a, another helium, they're going to fit together really nicely. But then you can imagine that if we had uh, something with some pi bonds or, or some p orbitals over here trying to interact with this helium, we're going to have not as good interactions. And so we're going to have a different, the, the amount of energy that we get back by creating bonding and anti-bonding orbitals is, is less good. But the basic, the basic premise is we have atoms, let's do a prefer look at one that actually forms. <laughs> we have atoms that come together and the orbitals can overlap. Sometimes you'll, you'll see lines down this saying, hey, there's, there's the energy of the orbitals is, is now lower, more stable. And the energy of the anti-bonding orbitals is higher, less stable, right? You might see lines like that. But we're basically, we're gonna be bringing atoms together. We're gonna to see how they, the orbitals can overlap. And if they overlap well, then we can get a bonding orbital and an anti-bonding orbital through constructive and destructive interference. And then we look at how many electrons do we have available to put into making that particular compound. And look, oh, we've got two that are in the bonding orbital, none that are in the anti-bonding orbital. And so H2 as a molecule forms quite nicely. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Dr. Hunter.